Welcome to the American Railroading Podcast, brought to you by the Revolution Rail Group, live from the great state of Texas. Join us as we educate, entertain, and explore the world of American railroading. Here's your host, industry veteran, Don Walsh. Well, hey, everybody, and welcome to the American Railroading Podcast. I am your host, Don Walsh, President and CEO of the Revolution Rail Group. We are the anchor sponsor of the American Railroading Podcast. We're a consulting and brokering firm in the railroad industry, so if you're in need of any railroad-related uh, consulting or brokering, buying, selling, leasing, or subleasing of rail assets, please feel free to reach out to us at 844-455-3434 or through our website at therevolutionrailgroup.com, or you can email us at info at therevolutionrailgroup.com. So let me first start out by saying thank you so much for all the birthday wishes. So I've, I've made it another year around the sun, um, so that's always a good thing, I think. Um, so I'm 25 again, it's an amazing thing. Uh, so thank you so much. I'm celebrating the whole month. So if you feel like sending any more, uh, candy flowers, uh, gifts, no, I'm kidding. You don't have to send anything, but, but thank you. It's been great. All the messages through LinkedIn, uh, emails, phone calls, text messages. It's been a total blessing. And, and thank you again for joining us on our journey on the American Railroading podcast as well. Um, and speaking of which, I want to tell you some more good news. So it keeps coming, right? The, the hits keep coming. We are now officially in the top 10% of all podcasts globally, and that's over 3 million podcasts. I think it's 3,167,000, something like that, but that's incredible. Uh, so we're still a reasonably new podcast. Uh, we were, this is episode six, which is another landmark for us, milestone for us. Um, I believe, Producer John, you can give me a thumbs up if I'm right. You said that uh, most podcasts don't make it past episode five. So he's shaking his head, giving a thumbs up. So we are good at episode six. We have broken another milestone. And that's thanks to all of you. That's thanks to you listening and downloading and, and sharing. And uh, we're very excited. It's truly a blessing. So please continue to download, continue to share. And also leave us reviews because I know I mentioned it in our last episode. But reviews really help us a bunch, especially whether they're on our website at AmericanRailRing.net or whether they're on your favorite platform. And we're on 29 different platforms now, which is crazy in 19 different countries. Um, but if you share the review, it, it catches up with these algorithms on the interweb and it helps push our podcast out to even more people to enjoy. So please give us those reviews, especially if they're good ones, especially if they're great ones, uh, please give us those reviews and we look forward to, to seeing them, reading them. And if you've liked what you've heard, and you can also go to our website at AmericanRailroading.net and you'll see a little yellow coffee cup in the left-hand corner. And that's where you can buy us a cup of coffee. Right. It's literally like leaving us a tip if you think we did a good job. Now, you don't have to do that, so please don't feel obligated. But if you'd like to, you're more than welcome to. And we'd like to thank everyone who has and those of you that will. Um, so you can buy one cup, three cups, five cups or ten cups, and it goes directly to support the podcast and our efforts here. Uh, we also want to make sure that you don't forget. Please do not forget to nominate your favorite U.S. Armed Forces veteran in the Honor Our Heroes um, giveaway. And that's being sponsored by our friends here in Tomball, Texas at Boots for Troops, Jimmy and Lindsey Rogers. So uh, we've gotten some, we have gotten some, we've gotten more since our last episode. So thank you for that. And I got to tell you that the, they've been incredible. Um, I just read one before I came here today for the podcast and uh, it was just amazing to read. And I, I don't want to give too much away, but we ask that you write a little paragraph about why this hero should be nominated for an honor our heroes gift package. And the, the paragraph was so heartfelt and, and that's what we're looking for. I mean, Gosh, yeah, I mean, honestly, brought me to tears. And so that's awesome. We, we love that you love your heroes as much as we do. Please continue to nominate folks for the Honor Our, Hero, Honor Our Heroes gift package. Um, we are allowing submissions up to August 31st, 2023. So by the time this airs, it'll only be a few days, maybe a week at most. So please get those nominations in. If you don't know how to do that, um, I actually posted that on LinkedIn. Uh, gosh, I want to say about a week ago or so. So you can look at my LinkedIn posts to see Otherwise, stay tuned through the end of this episode. I will, again, repeat the, the process for you. And please get those nominations in as soon as you're able. We talked about challenge coins. So we have our own challenge coins coming out that we've designed. And they look amazing. The order is in. They should be arriving in the next couple of weeks. When they do, I will let you know. Because our merch is coming this month as well. I promised you we'd have our merch set up by the end of August. We're going to get that done. So you'll be able to do both of those, um, get the challenge coins and our merch through our website at AmericanRailroading.net. So there will be a page that you can go to and buy merch and, and, and obtain your challenge coins that way as well. 
Um, and then last but not least, I want to talk a little bit about what we're going to get into today on today's episode, episode six. Did I say that already? Episode six, Milestone. Um, we're going to talk about the economy, the U.S. economy and how rail relates to it and how it relates to rail. And I just thought it would be a fitting topic for today, uh, not only because it's important to all of us, but also our last episode with our good friend Denson White at APM Terminals. We talked about supply chain and intermodal. And we did touch on the economy because, of course, supply chain and intermodal affects the economy. Um, so this just seemed like a perfectly dovetailed um, topic to discuss. And it's funny because uh, when people ask me what I do for a living, people that I've just met, um, they say, uh, you do what? <laughs> or people still use rail? Uh, yes and yes. Uh, we do still use rail a lot, and it impacts the economy quite a bit. And we're going to get into that today. Now, um, a good friend of mine, is our guest today, and, and he's going to get into the economy uh, much deeper than I could, and he's much more well-versed, and he's going to make a whole lot more sense than I would as well. Uh, but our, my good friend Todd Tronowski is our guest today. He is Vice President of Rail and Intermodal with FTR, and if you're not familiar with FTR, that stands for Freight Transportation Research. He is also based here in sunny and warm Houston, Texas. Uh, so those of you that are watching the video probably can see that I'm wearing my khaki shorts and a polo, and that's because it is ungodly hot <laughs> right now. So uh, so bear with me. I'm not trying to show off the guns or anything. It's just really hot out there. Um, so give you a little bit of background on Todd. Todd graduated from Temple University with a dual Bachelor of Arts degree in both history and journalism. In Todd's current role as VP of Rail and Intermodal, he is the chief analyst for rail and intermodal-related market data for FTR. Prior to his time at FTR, Todd worked at Argus Media, which I'm very familiar with because of being in uh, the petrochemical world and energy sector, primarily in rail, um, very familiar with Argus Media, where he held roles with as a reporter for petrochemical products, petroleum products, a reporter for transportation, editor for Argus Rail Business, and eventually editor of U.S. transportation as a whole. Uh, Todd is also a frequent speaker at Rail Shipper events, which is where we actually met. We met years ago at the Southwest Association Rail Shippers Conference, and then more recently saw you at the Midwest Association Rail Shippers Conference in Lake Geneva, Wisconsin. He also hosts a weekly podcast, so he's a fellow podcaster, uh, called the FDR Rail Market Update. He's also a Philadelphia native and is a diehard Philly sports fan, and even worked as a sports reporter uh, covering AA baseball in New Jersey early in his career. So with that, Todd, welcome to the American Railroading Podcast. Thank you, Don. Happy to be here. Thanks for the invite. My pleasure. And is there anything that I missed about you that you'd like to share with our listeners? <laughs> well, I mean, you got the important stuff in. The fact that, you know, a native Philadelphia, you know, we're going to talk about the economy. You know, you all probably saw the news reports last year about how what the economy does when Philadelphia teams do well. Well, we're about to start football season again. The Phillies are doing well. So, you know. That sort of tells you where the economy might go as we go forward in time. You know, draw so, your own conclusions. So that's the barometer. Keep an eye on Philadelphia sports. <laughs> of course. <laughs> Good to know. <laughs> well, I have to ask, how in the world did you go from journalism to transportation and eventually to rail? Well, that's a that's a long story. We got time. You know, I was, you know, I, I was took the journalism degree. You talked about that. You know, wanted to be a sports writer. Wanted to be a sports reporter. Wanted to get all the way up and, and cover the Phillies. Right. Mm -hmm. You know, got to do that for, for a little bit. Got to cover the, the Trenton Thunder. Those of you that really know baseball know that's a double A team up in Trenton, New Jersey. You know, covered them for, for quite a long time, for quite a while. It was great. But then decided, you know, the thing about sports is everybody wants to do it. And because everybody wants to do it, you don't make very much. <laughs> so I had to, you know, you know, had to become an adult, had to get a real job and came down to Houston with Argus and started covering petroleum products pricing. And then about a year into that down here in Houston, they looked at me and said, wait a second, you've got this boutique rail knowledge that you acquired during college and you're working for a commuter railroad up there. You've still got family up there. Our rail publication is based up in D.C. Why exactly are you in Houston again? Okay. <laughs> so went up there, spent six and a half years covering the legislative railroad side of the industry, and then eventually got brought back down to Houston because that's where their U.S. headquarters is. And when I made the transition to FTR over five years ago now, they basically said, you know, we're already a hybrid organization. If you're in Houston, you like it in Houston, you can stay in Houston. So here we are. Well, and I actually remember when you were with Argus, so it's been five years now that you've been with FTR. Yeah, okay, almost six. And I didn't know that you worked in commuter rail in college. So tell me a little bit about that. It was really just very, you know, so, and, 
getting an understanding of service planning and service design and a sense of, okay, where does the, how can we become more efficient? What is the rider experience like? What are things we can do, you know, from a crew perspective to make that, uh, to make that better, to make that more efficient for our riders? Because in the commuter railroad world, unlike the freight railroad world world, you're not generally going to go out and buy more equipment. You know, you have the amount of cars you have and you got to be creative as to how you generate additional capacity. Mm -hmm. And that's one thing I've never been involved with as a commuter rail. So I find that fascinating. I have to pick your brain about that sometime over, over coffee. I think that's really neat. Um, so every time I run into you at the different events and I have to laugh about this too, because it's the same with any of my friends here in Houston, we're good friends. You know, we all live in the same area, but we never see each other unless we're at a conference. Anywhere else, it could be in Phoenix, it could be in, like I said, Lake Geneva, Wisconsin, but uh, <laughs> we literally live 15 <laughs> minutes away from each other. Um, but when I do see you, I always learn something new. It, it's I, I love talking to you whenever I run into you. Um, there's always some nugget, like like just today, I didn't know about you working in commuter rail before, but you always have some industry nugget for me um, that I think is great, and for other people as well, because you do a lot of speaking at these events. Um, so in our last episode, as I said, we talked about supply chain, we talked about intermodal, its effect in, on the economy. We didn't delve into the economy a whole bunch, um, but I just really felt that was a great topic for today. So thank you again for coming in and being willing to join us. And in studio, by the way, you are now the second guest that we've had in studio. Uh, so it, it, I'm grateful that you were able to join us. A little bit about uh, railroad history for everyone listening and watching, if you're watching. Um, the first railroad is said to have begun in the United States in the early 1700s. In an article from the Smithsonian Institute, uh, National Museum of American History at AmericanHistory.si.edu, it states in part that the timeline of America on the move begins in 1876, the, the nation's centennial. By that time, railroads had already spanned the continent and united the country in unprecedented ways uh, for transportation networks. The economy began a huge expansion, growing almost tenfold in the last quarter of the 19th century. Compared to earlier forms of transportation, which was at that time by wagon, road, canal, before the Civil War, railroad transport um, was about 10 times cheaper and 10 times faster. In 1860, railroads carried 3.2 billion ton miles of freight, and by 1900, that figure was 141 billion ton miles, a stunning 44-fold increase. So you fast forward to 2018, and that number skyrocketed to 1.7 trillion ton miles, according to the Union Pacific Railroad article from June 1st of 2021 called Track Record at UP.com, which refers to information from the Department of Transportation. So it's clear to see the enormous impact that the rail industry and rail freight has made on the U.S. economy over the last 230 years. So I'd like to start out by discussing our economy in general just to kind of get everybody up to speed on what our economy is all about. So we hear the acronym GDP a lot. And for the sake of our listeners that don't really know what that means, could you take a moment and just explain what GDP is and why it's important to our economy? Sure, sure. GDP is gross domestic product, and it's, it's the broadest indicator there is of economic activity. It essentially tries to figure out what is the value of goods produced by the country in a given period. Now, normally it's reported quarterly, and there are revisions to that data several times before it becomes final. And then th those four quarterly outputs then get basically rolled up into the annual figure. Okay. And so I imagine that our GDP took a pretty hard hit during the pandemic. So how is our GDP looking today? Well, it certainly did. During the pandemic, you can see, and you look at a chart of GDP, you can see the second quarter of 2020, it it drops down 43%. And then in the third quarter of 2020, it goes back up. And sometimes people look at that and say, well, what is that? Well, that, that's the pandemic effect. That's what happens when you shut down most of the national economy and then bring it back up. And then that, that is the effect of that. And when you th coming out of the pandemic, even in 2021, we had strong GDP growth. Mm -hmm. We had GDP growth 5 6 7%. And now we're back down to 1% or 2% GDP growth. And that's one of the things people have gotten concerned about, right? When they say it's a slowing economy. Well, mm -hmm. yes, GDP, the rate of production, the rate of economic output is slowing. Yeah. That is true. But in a broader context, when you think about starting the economy from zero, those 6 7% quarterly increases in, in activity, 
were never going to be sustainable. You were always going to see a downshift. Yeah. And so our, our attitude on the economy has been that it's really normalizing. And that as we think about it going forward, we're really just talking about a slow growth economy, getting back to a normal, slow growth environment, which one or two percent growth, people get concerned about it. Certainly when you think about the economic risk profile, you think about what the risks are to the economy. They're almost uniformly to the downside. So that slow growth, you get an external factor on the economy and it could, you know, it could go negative. It could, it could create you know, a bigger problem. Mm-hmm. But generally, when you think about economic activity broadly, the, those slow growth economies are the ones that, sh- that you enjoy, not because you know, growth is going gangbusters, but because when you think about recessions, recessions tend to happen when there's an overheating of economic activity. Well, in a slow growth economy, you don't get those dislocations. You don't get those, those overheated elements that tend to lead you to a correction, that tend to lead you to a recession. And so when we look at the economy going forward, we've settled into a slow 1%, 2% growth, and we think that pretty well continues through the rest of 23 and into 24 as we go forward, as long as there isn't an external shock, an external event to the system. Sure. And I know one of the concerns people had when the was recession and then stagflation. And mm-hmm. stagflation, my understanding is it literally stagnates. There's no movement. There's no growth. There's no anything. So the good news is that there doesn't seem to be stagflation taking place, right? Yeah. The good news is that we're continuing to grow. We're right. continuing to grow at a lower rate than we have historically, than we have in the recent past. That's what gets people worse. And there are certainly downside risks. And hopefully as we go through, we'll talk about some of those risks that aren't that aren't external, because there are some factors when you drill down into the economic data where you look at them and say, this has to change, or you know, this is a worrisome sign. This is an indicator to keep an eye on as we go forward to think about economic activity, to think about where those levers are that might go trip us from slow growth into a, a negative environment. Yeah, absolutely. And we talked about inflation just a little bit, but it's a topic on everyone's mind right now. You know, as costs are up in literally every area of our lives, whether it's food, whether it's gas, whether it's just cost of living. So what are the biggest drivers of inflation? Well, it's interesting that you say that because inflation, depending on what metric you use to measure inflation, you get a little bit different story. If you look at core CPI, which for for decades was the in vogue way the government talked about inflation, looked at the core CPI. And when they talk about core CPI, what they mean is they exclude food and fuel Mm. because they want to look at a more stable basket of goods, which is great. That's all well and good. I get wanting to smooth out volatility. We all, you know, want to look at a smooth picture, Mm -hmm. but I don't know about you, but as running a household, food and fuel are important aspects of my budget. Oh, for sure. And when you consider that consumer spending is two thirds of economic activity, if the consumer's budget is affected by those things, that has an effect on their ability to spend on other areas. And one of the things, one of the reasons why inflation was so difficult to cope with, and you think about it six, nine months ago, is because everything was going up. All total inflation was going up. If you look at it right now, what you see is total inflation is coming down and coming down rather dramatically. Core CPI, core inflation, you're coming down, but you're not coming down nearly as quickly. And you're not coming down nearly as quickly because what's driving the decline, what's driving the dramatic decline, are fuel prices. Okay. Now, that's reversed a little bit here in the last three, four weeks, but that data hasn't come out yet. So what we may see when the new data comes out in a week is we might see things turn around. We might see inflation go, show signs of going back up. And certainly the Fed talked a little bit about that in their meeting minutes where they talked about you know having some... some concerns that inflation, that the inflation battle might not be over. Mm. Okay. And so what does CPI stand for? That's the consumer price index. Got it. So that is basically how quickly consumer prices across a basket of consumer goods are rising or falling. Okay. Very good. And speaking of consumers, so consumer spending tends to be a pretty good indicator of the pulse of our economy. So what does the current consumer spending look like these days? And, and what does that tell us? Well, consumer spending right now is actually 
for all the inflation, for all of the light and heat and discussion around inflation, the consumer continues to spend. Hmm. The consumer continues to go out there and, 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 and put dollars to work in the economy. So you talk about, okay, how does that continue to happen? Well, there are a couple of ways that continues to happen. The first is the labor participation rate has increased over the last several months. And so you're seeing people who came out of the workforce during the pandemic now going back into the workforce. So some households are going from one income to two incomes. And so that obviously has a dramatic effect on household income, household sure. budgets, and that allows additional spending to continue even in the face of high inflation. The other is that the labor market gen broadly is in pretty good shape. You look at the gap between job openings and job hires, and there's still a significant delta there. So folks who, who want a job, folks who want to switch careers, switch industries, they feel like they can do that. And generally, they can do that at a pay raise. And so the strong labor market gives the consumer that confidence that even if I want to move on from my job, even if I lose my job, I'm going to be able to find something else to go into. Mm -hmm. So that helps the consumer feel good about spending. And also, they're also doing debt. If you look at household debt levels, there was a report, I guess, a week ago now, talking about consumer debt, about how it passed $1 trillion for the first time ever. You know, that's an important metric. And it's an important metric to the absolute level of consumer debts going up. It's also important because when you look at credit card delinquency rates, mm -hmm. they have come up dramatically over the last, call it three, four, five months. Now, they're back to a normal range, what we'd call historically normal. But if you look at the slope of the line over the last four or five months, it cannot continue to rise the way it has. Okay. If it does, then we're going to have a very different conversation here as we get to the end of the year about the consumer's ability to continue to spend. One last note on the consumer, we're also seeing them not save as much. Mm. We're seeing them continue to spend at the expense of their own savings. Now, that is okay. That works. It works for a time. It doesn't work over the long run. And yes, the savings rate has ticked up over the last couple of months. We've seen it come back. We are still about half of the normal rate. I, my argument is that that's unsustainably low over time, that folks are going to have to put more money away. And households only have so much money. So if there's additional money that has to go into savings or as student loan payments restart in the fall for some people, as they start to have to devote more money to debt service, they're not able to spend as much. And so that's... That consumer spending piece is something I'm really watching to see as we get into the fall. How durable is that? What do holiday expenditures look like? What do holiday expectations look like? That's really where the spotlight will be as we go forward. So just so I understand, we're saying that the credit card debt's up, but savings amounts are down, but spending hasn't changed yet. Yet. Interesting. Well, and so what are capital goods? I, I've heard of capital goods. Um, what are they? What role do they play in our economy? Sure. A core capital goods orders is, is the, the economic metric. And really, it's when a business goes out and invests in equipment, invests in plant, invests in technology. So and a facility goes in and buys uh, additional robots or buys uh, additional machines, additional, additional tool and die machines, some sort of a physical investment generally. So something that it's going to use and depreciate out over the course of its business. Okay. So would that be like a, a capital expenditure kind of thing? Basically. Got yeah. it. Okay. I think most people will understand that one. Um, so we all like new things. Speaking of capital expenditures, <laughs> <laughs> we all like new things, especially new cars, right? Yeah. And new cars seem to be kind of the, the barometer that media likes to use. Um, cause I don't know how many times in my life I've heard new car sales are up, you know, in, in some local television report. And that's supposed to be an indicator for us of the health of our economy. Of course, the pandemic again had a major impact on it. And we talked about that in supply chain in our last episode, um, regarding manufacturing. So how is new car manufacturing today? And are we back to normal yet? We are. Okay. We are, and we have been for about the last quarter and a half, I'll call it really the end of the first quarter, early second quarter, we really saw a normalization. You saw 
the volumes come back to around 25,000 carloads a week in motor vehicles. Mm. Now, that's good not just for motor vehicles. That's good because you think about what goes into a motor vehicle. You've got all of that fabricated steel and aluminum. You've got all of the plastic resins that go in, all the plastic pieces. Most pieces, think about when you're in your car, when you hit the turn signal, when you play with the radio button, when you play with the door lock button. It's all plastic. That's all got to be built. That's all got to be made. And so automobile manufacturing at strong levels helps all those ancillary levers as well, all those ancillary industries that feed into the finished vehicle market. And the, the automotive market is really very interesting. When you look at all the issues they had during the pandemic with semiconductors and not being able to meet demand, as that normalizes, they're still very much in a hole. You know, you still look down at the, the car dealers as you, you're driving by on the highway, certainly here in Houston, certainly in other parts of the country as well. You know, there's more, there are more cars on the lot, but it's still not back to where it was. Mm -hmm. And if you look at the inventory to sales ratio, when you have to sh almost strip out automotive from retail sales, inventory to sales ratios to be able to, to get a clean picture because we're still so far below in automotive. And so that tells us two things. That tells us, one, that the consumer demand is still there, and it tells us that because of the inventory drawdown, even if sales start to slow down, we're still going to have a quarter or two of solid production to rebuild those inventories, to get those inventories back to more normal levels. And so that, that's a great thing. And when you look at motor vehicle and parts output from uh, uh, the economic indicators, you can see that it it's, continues to run strong. It continues to hold in. It continues to even tick up a little bit, even as you have you know some yellow flashing lights in the consumer, even if you have a slow growth GDP environment, a slow growth freight environment, you're not seeing that in automotive. You're not seeing that among that sector. It continues to go flat out. Wow. And so that may actually answer my next question. Um, and maybe you don't have an answer for this, but it sounds like this is, you may have already just kind of touched on it. So what will it take to get car prices back to normal? Because obviously this, it was a huge change after the pandemic right or in the during the pandemic because of all the reasons we've talked about and maybe it's just me but i was hoping that those numbers would start to come back to what we saw before or maybe somewhat normalize but i'm not seeing that yet so is that something we should is this the new normal well at least for the short run at least for the next few quarters we've seen in the used market you've seen prices start to come down both for used vehicles as well as for used class 8 trucks You've seen the price start to come down for those vehicles. But in the new market, you continue to see strong pricing because we haven't rebuilt those inventories. So while the only cars on the lot aren't a, a hot pink Saturn view and a, a Lincoln Navigator with all of the, the bells and whistles platinum package, you know, where the consumer's like, well, this doesn't really help me very much. Uh, you have more options than you had during the pandemic. You still don't have all of the options that you become accustomed to, all of the trim levels. And so it's going to take some time to get there. It's going to take probably two or three more quarters before you get back to a, a normal market, start to see incentives come back, start to see prices come down to a level where uh, it's more normal. Yeah. And the interesting thing is that consumer demand continues to be, be strong. Now, some of that's pent up demand during the pandemic when they couldn't get that. Sure. But cert not all of it is. And if you think about what's going into that, you know, you're financing a depreciating asset at a fairly healthy interest rate. You know? So you have to think about what that looks like and how, how that demand will continue if the economy does downshift. Right. And then again, going back to what people's savings are versus their debt load. So yeah, right. Um, so you mentioned inventory a couple of times, and that leads me to talking about inventory levels in general. So in general, inventory levels do have an effect on our economy, right? So what are current inventory levels generally, and, and what does that tell us also about our economy? Well, it depends on the sector of the economy that we're talking about, because all three sectors of the economy, and just for everybody out there, there are three, when we talk about inventories, there are three main sectors of the economy that we're talking about, the manufacturing economy, the wholesale economy, and the retail economy. I talked a little bit about the automotive situation and what that does to retail. So let's retail and retail ex-automotive. 
And let's talk about those four categories. The manufacturing inventories, when you look at it on an inventory to sales ratio basis, it's very high. Hmm. It's very, very high. It's elevated. It's really above where it was in 2018, 2019. Okay. When you look at wholesale inventory, it is higher than it has been at any point in the last 13 years. So wholesale inventories are still very high, and that might explain why industrial production and why the ISM manufacturing index is below 50, because even though orders are coming in, they don't necessarily need to go in and produce that next widget. They have it in inventory. Okay. And so that's a sign that says those economies, they're going to be the first to feel a slowdown, and they're going to be the ones that are going to stay slowest growth for the longest period of time. So that leaves us with the retail sector. And I said there, there's sort of two breakdowns here. There's, there's retail, which if you look at just the retail number, it is below normal. It is at a, at a historically low level. It's working its way back, but it's historically low. A lot of that, like we just talked about, is fully res- the result of low automotive inventory. If we start looking at retail inventories, X automotive. So this is the kind of stuff you'd find at, your favorite big box retailer, your favorite department store. If you look at those inventories, they're pretty much back to normal levels. Okay. They're pretty much back to pre-pandemic normal. So when you're talking about inventories, what does that mean? If the inventory to sales ratio is normal, inventories are okay at the moment and will be okay into the future, provided the sales continue. Like we just talked about with the consumer, with the downsides to the economy, the potential downsides for the consumer economy, if sales slow down, then inventories could increase rather dramatically rather quickly. Okay. Because there's, there's enough inventory to meet sales demand, but that assumes that sales demand continues at the healthy levels that we've seen. And if you look at some of the, the earnings reports that are out there, Home Depot, you know, they, they beat earnings estimates, but they had a pretty, do, a pretty dour outlook as you know, people are, are, consumers are not going in for big ticket items. They're not going in for sort of the durable household goods, the clothes dryers, the washing machines, the, the, the hot water heaters, those sort of bigger ticket purchases. Now, if we remember back, there was an awful lot of, of investment made by consumers in those goods during the pandemic. You look at the one retail sector that did really well in 2020 and 2021, it, it was the, the building products folks. It was the Home Depots, the Lowe's, the Ace Hardwares, as folks went in and worked on their homes. Well, a, a durable good is something that lasts, you know, five, six, ten years. You don't, when you're around your house and you replace a dishwasher, you don't generally go back and replace the dishwasher the next month or the next quarter. It's years before you have to go in and do that. So it's it's not surprising that we're paying a little bit of that pandemic demand in those retail sectors back now. Yeah. And you mentioned um, inventory levels and how um, we're backfilling and some of that. So just in time inventory, that was at least for me in my world, in the rail car repair world that I grew up in, um, that was a big deal because you were trying to not hold a bunch of inventory. So you would ask people to do consignment or have some way of creating this just in time, right? And the whole uh, lean process, the 5S, you know, that has a little bit to do with that as well, which I think are great processes, don't get me wrong. But did we overdo it a little bit? And that's what led to some of the issues that we, we had. And are we rethinking that now? Well, it's a balancing act, right? And that's one of the things that we've seen over time is that we had this push, as you said, to just in time inventory. Well, what we saw during the pandemic is that when the supply chain went down, when we tried to, everybody tried to go through that pipe at once when we restarted the economy, there wasn't room for everybody. You know, the railroads don't have track capacity for everybody to move at once. Just like you don't build a church for Easter Sunday. <laughs> you know, you, you, you have a finite capacity to try and get through. And that created headaches and that created out of stocks and that created alternative transportation arrangements that, in a lot of cases, didn't make a lot of sense, but were what people needed to do to get the job done. Well, when you think about just in time, th- there's a balancing act. I think a lot of people went the other direction in the immediate post-pandemic period and said, you know, we're going to go to a just-in-case model where we're going to have 
more inventory than we need on hand just to make sure that we don't get caught short by the supply chain because rail service might go down again because you might have trouble getting getting trucks you might have you know you might have uh, port delays and ocean shipping delays you might have some of those issues we need to be prepared so that we can't go out of stock well in the immediate post pandemic period to now what has happened the same thing that's driven inflation up has also driven interest rates up so a just in case inventory strategy works when money's cheap when it's not costing you anything to have that inventory on a shelf. One of the reasons, if we go into the Wayback Machine in the, the 90s and 2000s, the reason Just In Time really came into vogue and why people really embraced it was because it meant you didn't have to carry inventory. It saved you that carrying cost. Now we're back in a high interest rate environment again, certainly higher than a generation of consumers and a generation of professionals have seen in their career. Now that that inventory on that shelf, it's not earning you a return right now. It's costing you money. And does that push us over time back to a just-in-time model? And are we willing to accept the headaches that we sometimes get from the just-in-time model to save that carrying cost? And that, that's going to be a different calculation for every business. Certainly, if, if you're an electric utility plant and you, you can't run out of coal when it's 104 degrees and... In Texas in, in summer, please no. You know, you, you know, <laughs> just in, in case is how you have to operate. If you're, you know, if you're Walmart for a, a particular promotion you're running, you have to weigh those costs and say, okay, what is just in time versus what is just in case, and how do I want to, how do I want to manage that? And I don't think either way is necessarily a silver bullet or a, a, a guaranteed way to, to to solve the problem. But I think each business is going to have to figure that out for themselves. And there's probably a middle road where you keep some level of inventory on hand to, to insulate yourself from, from fragile supply chains. That Let's face it, the, no matter what mode you're using, it's a fragile supply chain. It remains a fragile supply chain. So there, you cannot run just in time quite the way you did in the past. Yeah, yeah, I agree. And you touched on interest rates. Uh, just a moment ago. So interest rates certainly aren't what they were pre-COVID either. Uh, obviously, that's changed quite a bit. So how is our housing market looking today, for instance, uh, and what impact are the current interest rates having on it? <laughs> you had to ask a question to get a negative answer. No. <laughs> just, 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 we're educational here, right? <laughs> you know, the, the housing market has struggled. Yeah. And it, you look at housing starts, you look at housing permits, uh, it, it's a tough market. And it's a tough market for a lot of reasons. Some of them, a lot of them go back to interest rates mm -hmm. because you've got mortgage rates that are up at between 6 and 7%, depending on, on your credit and region of the country and what you're exactly trying to do. So that has two effects on the housing market. Number one, it makes it harder for folks who are looking for that first house who maybe ha don't have the credit history that, that, that second home buyers or uh, more seasoned professionals have. So it's going to be harder for them to get credit. They're going to be able to afford less house. And they're maybe thinking, well, in my lifetime, this is also the group, remember, that is in that generation of people who have not seen interest rates this high. Right. They're used to 2 3 4% interest rates. So they look at 6 or 7 and go, well, that'll come down. I'll just wait. I'll just stay out of the market and wait for it to come down. Now, folks who, who have lived through cycles know that there is no guarantee that that comes down in the short run. Certainly, uh, my parents and other people certainly remember when you know 12%, 13% on a mortgage was a good rate. I was going to say, I think my parents said they were at 13. Yeah, you, you got that rate and you felt good about it. You felt good about a 13% interest rate. I think if you went out and talked to most young first-time homebuyers today, and you told them to be happy about a 13% interest rate, they'd look at you like you had five heads. But it certainly it is something that it keeps people from, from going out and buying that house. In addition to all the consumer metrics we talked about in terms of how much money households have on their balance sheets. Now, the other piece of it is that you keep existing homes from existing homeowners from making a move at these interest rates. If you bought a house, any time in the last 10 years, and you have a 30-year fixed mortgage rate on your existing house, 
that's let's call it two and a half percent. Now you you up and move and you buy a new house. Now you're going to reset your mortgage rate to six and a half percent. That doesn't really encourage you to make that move. So it freezes out the housing market on two fronts in terms of, of that demand. And we've certainly seen that from a rail perspective. When you look at lumber shipments, when you look at lumber demand, we're well off last year. We're well off the five-year average. The latest numbers that were reported today uh, took another step down. So it's a decidedly weak trend line. And it's going to take that housing market to come back to, to, to push that up, to, to support that lumber market. But it's, it's a long road. You know, it's going to take uh, it's going to take interest rates either resetting or folks deciding that you know maybe six and a half is as good as it's going to get right now, and I'd rather pay six and a half than thirteen. Right, and I can say here in Houston we're seeing a lot of growth. We're continuing to see a lot of growth in building. Um, so maybe we'll make up the difference <laughs> <laughs> and get some of those lumber lumber rail rail cars moving again. Um, during the pandemic, companies furloughed and laid off employees, including in rail, obviously. And once things started moving again, there were more jobs available than there were people looking to fill them. We talked about this a little bit earlier on. So I'd like to take a, a, just a moment to break down uh, employment into a few different questions in the segments. So you talked about it earlier, labor participation. And we often hear about labor participation rate when it's compared to un the unemployment rate or, or included with the unemployment rate. So can you take a moment just to explain to folks that maybe don't know what labor participation rate is, how that's made up? Sure. Labor participation rate is a metric where a couple tenths of a movement is a huge movement. Because what you're looking at is you're looking at how much of the eligible employment age population is actually out employed. And so what, how many people are out there in the market? And so you're looking at just the, the employable pool. So you're looking from 18 to, 18 to 65, roughly. And you're looking at that, that, and then they break it down further by demographics. But the general number is just what percentage of the eligible labor pool is actually employed and, and, and out there looking for work. How much, what is our participation in the labor market? Okay. And when the pandemic uh, opened things back up again, we, we expected to see that number really jump and it, it didn't necessarily. Are we seeing that improvement now? We're seeing definitely, we're seeing a little bit of that improvement, but we're still not back to where we were during the pandemic. You know, we saw a huge drop off during the pandemic and just after, because if you think about what happened during the pandemic, the schools closed, the daycares closed. So anybody who has kids at home, one of those parents, if they don't have work from home flexibility, now is work, now is staying home. And so that has a huge impact on labor participation. And we've been getting that back slowly over time as schools reopened, as daycares reopened, as people were able to want to were more comfortable getting back into the workforce. We're seeing that happen. And that's helping us continue to support labor participation over time. But it's not you can't snap your fingers and go back into the labor force. It takes some time. It takes even in a, a labor environment that we are in. If you're in a particular field, not all fields are created equal. And the pandemic has certainly changed. It's encouraged a technology. It's encouraged automation. So depending on what sector you were in, that ability to get that job differs. For sure. And, and thank you. That was a great explanation, uh, especially regarding two-income households. Yeah, that's a very good point. So you've, you've already really kind of explained this, so I don't want to ask it twice, but um, but how does labor participation rate affect the unemployment rate? So the more people that are looking to be employed, obviously that number improves. Exactly. The, the unemployment rate, it's only looking at people who are actively looking for work. So they're, they're, those are people who are actually out there, you know, applying for jobs, looking for work, wanting to be employed. So if you drop out of the workforce and you don't actively look for a job, you're not counted in that unemployment rate. Okay. So it's important to, to bear that in mind. And that's one of the things in sometimes you'll see in recessions, the unemployment rate goes down, even if the economy doesn't improve because people fall out of, out of the unemployment pool. People just, you know, they, they get fatigued, they get burned out. They don't want to be in the labor pool. They don't want to be looking for work. Once you're not looking for work, you get pulled out of the unemployment rate. 
Got it. No, that's a very good point. And so how are we looking today regarding the overall employment in the United States? Overall employment, you're still doing really well. Folks who want jobs can get jobs. You look at the gap, we talked about it a little bit earlier in terms of openings and, and hires, and there, there's still a healthy, healthy gap there. If you want a job, generally you can get a job. Now, it may not be your dream job. It may not be, you know, sports casting for the Phillies, but you can get a job. <laughs> but if you wanted to do that, <laughs> maybe you could. <laughs> You've done it. Not the Phillies, but no. still, which I still want to talk about at some point because I think that's fascinating. <laughs> <laughs> So the question everyone listening and watching right now probably is uh, asking themselves, uh, what does all this have to do with rail and what does this mean for rail? So let's get into that. So we'll begin with rail freight specifically. So per the Association of American Railroads at AAR.org, freight railroads account for roughly 40% of U.S. long distance freight volume measured in ton miles, which is more than any other mode of transportation. So of that, which rail segments would you say are the biggest drivers when it comes to freight miles and tonnage? Well, when it comes to freight miles and tonnage, particularly on ton miles, you think about the large bulk commodities because that's where you get a large amount of your tonnage from. So that's, those are things like coal, like grain, like crushed stone, those things that are, are very hard to transport long distances by other modes. Generally, if you're not moving it by rail, you're moving it by barge. Well, that means you have to have water access. You have to have that access. Not all parts of the country are going to have that access. So it really depends on, but in terms of ton miles, you're going to see rail be important because it has so many of those bulk commodities that are hard to move by truck. Yeah, for sure. And overall, what would you say the current state of rail freight is today and how is it looking moving forward? Well, it, when you look at the state of rail freight, and it's important to look at rail freight in the context of the economy, because if you look historically, rail carload data has typically been a forward indicator, a leading indicator of economic performance. So it's important from that perspective. It's also important because it gives you a sense of how the industrial economy is performing. It gives you that read of how things are going. And when you look at it right now, it's sort of steady as she goes. It sort of parallels GDP, at least on the carload side of the business. We'll talk about intermodal probably a little bit later, but when we're talking just carload commodities, just bulk commodities, you're really just at 1%, 2% growth. And so that's very close to what we're seeing in GDP. We're better than industrial production, which is a win for some carriers. But if you look historically and how Carlin has performed historically, it's generally been a little bit above GDP. We're right at GDP at the moment, really close to overall GDP. So that's, that's a win from a, a carload freight perspective. Well, we can go ahead and talk about intermodal now if you'd like. I know that's in, definitely in your wheelhouse. And it, I believe the numbers are that it's been the number one growth um, segment of rail for like 20, 25 years consistently. So what, what makes it such a driving factor in our economy? Well, it's a driving factor because it's really a lot of consumer goods move that way. A lot of imports. You think about things that you get at big box retailers that originate in places like China, Vietnam, uh, Philippines, places like that. You know, those are coming in containers. They're coming across on a steamship from Maersk or APM. They're coming across, they're getting unloaded at the ports, and they're moving inland by rail, inland by fairly long distances. But they're overwhelmingly consumer goods. Now, there's some 20-foot international intermodal where it's a manufactured good, it's industrial good, but the, the overwhelming majority are 40-foot containers or 53-foot containers, depending on whether we're talking international or domestic, which is, we can get down if we want, but it's, from an intermodal, it's really about the consumer economy. And one of the things, and it's also very service sensitive business, and that's one of the things coming out of the pandemic, as the railroad started to have congestion, as the port started to have congestion, shippers went other places. Mm -hmm. Shippers moved goods away from the West Coast. They moved it into the East Coast, the Gulf Coast. Markets that are important from an intermodal perspective because they're shorter haul. And but now I can go and I can get a truck. And I can go take it from New York, and I can take it into Chicago. I can take it into Cincinnati. I can take it into some of these places that from Los Angeles, from Seattle, from Oakland, 
I'm not going to do that by truck. I'm going to let rail take that. And there are some ports that, that gain share, and one's right in our backyard. Port Houston was one of the big winners of the, the port shift okay. in terms of volumes. But it, it created issues because you think about one of the major intermodal lanes, Houston to Dallas. Well, until a couple of months ago, service was fairly infrequent for, on an intermodal basis between Houston and Dallas. Now, it's only 250 miles between the two cities. So if you're an importer and you're bringing goods in, are you going to wait a week for a train or are you going to put it on truck and get it there today or tomorrow? Well, intermodal's not really competitive in that. You're going to go out and, and, and move the good by truck. And we've seen folks, and that's why you've seen some of the announcements over the last couple of months about adding service into Houston. From Houston to Dallas, increasing that frequency. Also, new services over to Denver, other places. Because they're trying, the railroads are trying to capture some of that volume growth in places like Houston that traditionally, when volumes have moved there, they've moved out by truck. Mm-hmm. And so it has implications for how the intermodal network looks going forward as these port shifts occur, assuming that we don't see volumes swing back to the West Coast. Now, imports are down. Consumer demand is slowing a little bit based on the import data. And intermodal has had its own issues because the trucking market has weakened. Active truck utilization has come down well below its historical average. I didn't know that. And so volumes on the eastern Gulf Coast that are, you know, sort of in on the fence as to whether they could go truck or intermodal, now truck's very competitive for that movement. So that hurts intermodal's competitiveness. The bad news for intermodal is that it's not likely to get better anytime soon. It's not likely to improve before next year's peak season. We're going into the peak season for intermodal, and we're not seeing anything in the numbers, anything in the weekly car numbers that suggest we're going to get any kind of a bump this year for peak season. On a full-year basis, intermodal is expected to be down 7% on a year-over-year basis just because of where imports are, because of the port shifts that have gone on, and because of the rail service issues that have lingered in retailers' minds and other importers' minds. Intermodal is going to face a lot of headwinds, particularly with truck where it is competitively. So what makes this peak season? Is it the holidays and all the goods that are shipped because of it? Exactly. It's, it's heading into the holiday season. All the retailers who are stocking up on Christmas trees and Christmas ornaments and extra goods for Black Friday sales and things of that nature that, that are, are being brought in now. They're being brought in as we end the summer. We're through back to school. Retailers are already thinking about what's going to be offered on Black Friday, what that's going to look like, and what merchandise they're going to need over the holiday season. Yeah. Well, that makes, that makes sense. So in our industry, we tend to look at new car builds as an indicator of where our economy is headed. So how are new car builds looking today, and, and what's our takeaway as an economic indicator as a result of that? Well, rail car... Rail cars, you can break it down a couple of different ways. When you look at deliveries, deliveries can be slow to respond. When you look at orders, orders in the second quarter, and we just got the second quarter data here uh, a couple of weeks ago, the second quarter order number was very strong. It was nearly double on a sequential basis in terms of what it was in the first quarter of the year. We were sort of settling in or thought we were settling into a a replacement steady rail car equipment market. And then we got this surprise second quarter order number, order number. And that pushed our expectations up. We do forecast five years out on, on, on build rates on and deliveries for the rail equipment market. And it pushed our numbers up. It pushed our numbers up because you don't generally get up in the morning and say, you know, I want a boxcar in my backyard. Let me go down <laughs> to Amazon and pick one up. Generally, you make that equipment order because you think you have freight demand. You have to either replace an existing piece of equipment or you have to meet new expansionary demand. And so we look at that as a sign of people went in and ordered in the second quarter. They want those cars. They're going to deliver those cars over the next few quarters, at least some amount of those cars over the next few quarters. Now, generally, there's about a three or four quarter lag from when a rail car order transitions into a rail car delivery. And so there's certainly that that dynamic at play, there will be a little bit of a lag there. But overall, it is positive 
for the rail car market. Now, that is to say, particular rail car types have all fared a little bit differently, and not every car type participated in that order boom in the second quarter. Which, make, which is understandable. And you talk about cyclical uh, things earlier with interest rates. So anyone that's been in our industry long enough has understood that our industry is cyclical, that rail is cyclical. And every so many years, there is a boom of some sort that benefits the industry and therefore our economy, uh, which can be driven by either global events or su subsidies being offered or something to that nature. So two of the booms that have been uh, affected our industry since I've been involved in the industry over the last 20 years or so was the ethanol boom in the early 2000s, which really didn't end up being the boom that people thought it would be. Um, but then also the Bakken oil boom between like 2013, 2015 and there. Do we see any booms on the horizon that could possibly impact rail in our economy, perhaps renewable fuels or something like that? Well, here's the thing. We don't have a catalyst to go back to you know, the numbers that we did in the mid-2010s. You think about some of those 2014, 2015, 2016 volume numbers when we were delivering 85,000 cars a year. We're not going back there. There's not the catalyst for that. Uh, we're we're going to be probably 50,000, between 40 and 50,000, pretty much close to replacement, really through the end of the decade. In turn, because we're in a slow growth economy, we're in a slow growth freight market. And so you've got some replacement, you've got a little bit of incremental freight demand. But in most cases, the cars that you're bringing in to replace those cars, you don't need as many as you're retiring, whether that's replacing a 50-foot boxcar with a 60-foot boxcar, whether that's replacing a 47-50-grain car with, with, with a 54-50-grain car. You know, you're, you're, you're moving up in capacity, whether that's moving a 263 tank car to a 286 tank car. You're not replacing those cars on a one-for-one -one basis. And so even if you get freight growth, you have a headwind. You have sort of natural resistance. And so we see the market between 40 and 50,000 through the end of the decade, but certainly with some, uh, with some bumps along the road. And you mentioned the rail car building industry being cyclical. It's always been cyclical, and it's also always built more cars than we've needed, whether it's ethanol, whether it's the center beams of the 2000s, back to the last housing boom. I mean, there are some of those cars that were delivered in 2006, 2007 that probably haven't turned a wheel. They've they're probably in went straight somewhere. into storage, <laughs> and they're waiting for somebody to get to a book value where they can just scrap it. Uh, you know, we certainly saw it with crude. We saw it with sand, with the small cube covered hopper. There's, and there, still, still do. Yeah, and there's, <laughs> yeah, that's another car that, you know, people were talking about, about converting those cars to cement service. Yes, there are some cars, some people that will change the gates on those cars and put it into cement service. When you think about the fact that at the peak, we had 35,000 excess sand cars. Excess. The cement excess. You know, the cement market is not going to absorb 35,000 cars. <laughs> you know, it, it's going to absorb 5,000, 6,000, maybe. You know, it's not, it's not going to solve the entire problem. And that's, I, I hear people recently talking about covered hoppers, maybe the jumbo pellet car, maybe being the next car that's potentially overbuilt. And I think it depends on who's making the orders. Orders for that car were very strong in the second quarter. I would love to know, you know, are producers making those orders? There are certainly projects slated to come online in late 24, early 25, where, yes, if you're a major company with a project coming online, you need those cars. Because they're part of the production process. They're where you store the pellet from the time it's produced to the time you sell it. If it's a lessor, particularly a financial lessor, you know, who may not have a plan for that car beyond an initial lease, that's where we start to get worried. That's where we start to, to get a little, well, maybe it is. And unfortunately, we don't know the identities of who's making the orders, but it, it depends on the quality of of that order book in terms of whether there's a, whether there's a build there. Yeah. An overbuild. Right. And uh, again, uh, just some, some interesting notes here from um, AAR.org. I like to give our listeners some tidbits here. And so um, uh, freight rails, safe and efficient operations. Again, this is per the association of American railroads. 
Uh, freight rail's safe and efficient operations propel the nation's economic success. They move the raw materials and finished goods essential to a wide range of industries, which you've mentioned earlier, from agriculture and chemical to automotives and construction, fueling the growth and prosperity of the country. In a typical year, railroads often move about 1.6 million carloads of grain and other farm products, more than 1.7 million carloads of food products, 1.8 million carloads of motor vehicles and parts, and around 3 million carloads of construction-related materials, about 700,000 carloads of pulp and paper products. That's a lot of stuff. <laughs> In 2022, U.S. rail intermodal volume uh, was 13.5 million units. The average carloads of crude oil originated in the United States was around 650 barrels of oil and freight. Railroads moved 3.4 million carloads of coal. Freight railroads moved about 2.3 million carloads of plastics, fertilizers, and other chemicals. In fact, from 1980 to 2022, America's freight railroads spent about $780 billion of their own funds, not government funds, on capital expenditures. We talked about capital expenditures earlier. Um, in order to uh, Im improve the maintenance and, and expense related to locomotives, freight cars, track, bridges, tunnels, and other infrastructure and equipment. And the reason I bring that up is, according to the U.S. Federal Highway Administration, freight shipments are expected to increase by another 30% from what they already are by 2040. So in your opinion, are we ready for such an increase? And if not, what do we need to do to be ready for that? Well, we, we need to invest and we need to invest across modes. You know, rail is not going to be the only one involved in moving that increase. It's going to be everybody. So you're going to have to see highway projects get built. You're going to have to see truck take on some of that. You're going to see so some work on inland locks and dams to make the barge industry, the barge network that much more efficient for folks that can help rail and create some capacity for rail to handle some of that growth. So it's going to take all of the modes working together to handle that. And rail certainly has a place there. They have a way to get in and, and be a part of the solution. Certainly when you think about carbon emissions, when you think about you know, moving toward a price of carbon and how that gets factored through supply chains, uh, certainly rail ha has a story to tell there to, to gain a piece of, of that increase in volume. But it's going to take all of the modes working together to be able to incorporate that kind of an increase in volume. Well, believe it or not, we're nearing the end of our episode. And so I was just curious if you had any key takeaways from our episode that you'd like to share with our listeners regarding the economy and rail. Well, in terms of the economy, keep an eye on the consumer. The consumer drives demand. And it's going to be that those consumer inputs, those consumer, if the consumer falters, everybody's going to feel it. And that's going to affect freight demand. That's going to affect capital investment for the railroads. A lot of the railroads set their capital expenditure budgets as a percent of revenue. If revenue goes down because shipments are down, that affects capital expenditure budgets. That affects how much freight's in the system to move. And that also translates all the way through to rail equipment. Rail, you know, rail equipment's going to have a longer tail on it. It's not going to react immediately to that lower uh, that lower economic activity, that lower freight volume, but it will over time. It will have to react, but it will have to show uh, its effects, and well, that's on an overall basis. Uh, certainly, there are some there are some car types that are already probably going to see deliveries slow down uh, sooner rather than later. Gondolas have already started; we expect that to continue. Boxcars. Do you know, Don? They built uh, almost 1,900 boxcars in the second quarter. No. That's the highest level since at least 1994. But we did have a lot of aging out, though. We do. Right? Yeah. We do. And we, we, but the order rate, these are orders that were made three, four quarters ago that mm -hmm. are getting delivered now. The deliveries have fallen off dramatically. And so when you get, you get a number like that for deliveries for boxcars, it's a bit like the old price is right when you play the dice game and you throw a six. And, and Bob puts the six in and goes... So is the next number higher or lower? Right. It lower. <laughs> so, you know, we're going to definitely see, you know, boxcar deliveries start to, to ramp down over the next couple of quarters and then get to that replacement level, get to that equilibrium level, and potentially could be made worse, could be uh, accelerated in some of these car types by a slowing economy, by a slowing consumer. 
So is there anything else you want to share with our audience? I know you have your podcast. You want to tell us a little bit about that? Sure, absolutely. We do. We have the FTR State of Freight Rail Market Update Podcast. And basically what we do every week is we give people sort of a, a 20-minute look at what rail volumes have done. The AAR data comes out middle of the week for the week prior. And we basically try to give people a, a synopsis of what the volume said in the last week and what we think it means uh, for the future. So it's, it's quick hitting. But it gives people a sort of a quick takeaway, quick thirty thousand foot view of this is where rail volumes are going in the in the near term. Excellent. And where can they find your podcast? They can find it anywhere podcasts are available. Spotify, Apple Podcasts, it's all it's out there across the across the mediums. Excellent. Well, thank you so much for joining us today. It's been amazing. I know we could have talked for another hour easily. So <laughs> having said that, would you like to come back and join us again? Anytime, Don. Thank you for the invite. It's always a pleasure to get in and talk about the industry. I agree. It's always a pleasure to see you, my friend. And so I'd like to take a moment here before we go to, again, recognize our anchor sponsor, the Revolution Rail Group. We are, again, a consulting and brokering firm in the rail car industry. Feel free to reach out to us if you have a need in either area at 844-455-3434 or at therevolutionrailgroup.com or info at therevolutionrailgroup.com. And for those of you that are going to be submitting a nominee for one of the Honor Our Heroes gift packages, please uh, do so by August 31st. That is the deadline. So let me walk you through once again what the process is, okay? So we've simplified it. And so now you just go to info at bootsfortroops.com. Again, that's info at boots, the number four, troops.com. Be sure to put in the, the subject uh, line there, the American Railroading Podcast, Honor Our Heroes nominee. Then you'll need to provide some of the following information. It's not too much. It shouldn't take you too long. Uh, just the nominee's name, the branch of military they served in, their rank, the years served, medals and awards, if you know what they are. Uh, if not, that's okay. And then what uh, really pulls at my heartstrings when I read them is the uh, just a quick uh, brief synopsis of why you feel this hero should be uh, nominated and uh, and I love what we, you've sent in so far. Um, it's really touched my heart, and that's exactly what I was hoping for. And and this is it's really uh, it's really heartwarming to see what you guys are sending in. So thank you for that. But please continue to send in nominations if you haven't already. Again, you have until August thirty first, and then we'll be announcing the winner in our September uh, podcast episode. We'll be bringing in our friends from Boots for Troops here in Tomball, Texas, and announcing the winner um, during that episode. So again, our challenge coins have been ordered. They're on their way. They should be here in a couple of weeks. I'm really excited about that. And I'll let you know how to get those when they arrive. Merch is coming as well. You'll be able to see that on the AmericanRailroading.net website. Um, stay tuned for our September episode. I'm not going to tell you what it's about yet, but it's cool. It's a lot of fun. You're going to be excited. And, uh, and then, like I said, we'll be announcing our Honor Our Heroes winner. So with that, I say God bless. Make it a great day. And we'll see you next time. Thanks for joining us on the American Railroading Podcast. If you've enjoyed what you've heard, please subscribe to the show on your favorite podcast app. And if you have a topic you'd like us to cover on a future episode or want to support or sponsor the show, please visit our website at AmericanRailroading.net.